Welcome to Journey Church Online. I'm Jackie Taylor, Associate Pastor. I'm so excited that you're watching with us today. I hope you'll like, tag, share, subscribe, and check out all of our other videos. All right, let's get that wonderful Journey Band in here. There'd be no pain But you promise you can go with me And your promises you always keep Lord, I confess how much I need you I confess that I am weak I can't promise I'll but your promises will not fail me When I'm in the valley I will fear no evil Let enemies surround me You prepare a table Surely goodness and mercy Will follow me Surely goodness and mercy
is. We worship a God who is. We worship a God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Our God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Accepted, redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise We were the beggars, now we're royalty We were the prisoners, now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Yeah, you got a minute? Yeah. Okay, listen, it's about that movie, okay? Son, we've already talked about the movie. I know we already talked about the movie, okay? But just hear me out, okay? Some of my friends are going to see the movie, mm -hmm. okay? And so what I'm saying is, I know the message of the movie does not coincide with the message of the Bible, okay? I'm aware of that. But it's just a little message, okay? It's just a little bit, so I don't think it matters, okay? And there, I know, there is some gore in the movie, okay? But listen, it's just a little gore, just a little, okay? And I know it's not real, okay? And there's some cussing, or as you would say, language in the movie, okay? And I know that, but it's just a little language, okay? And I know it's not real, okay? And there's some nudity, okay? Son. Don't let me hear me! Let me finish, okay? It's just a little nudity. It's just a little! And I know it's not real. Son. No, Dad, please, please, can I please go see the movie, please? Okay. I knew it! You don't ever let me do anything. I don't even know why I son, asked you son, what! Son, I said, you can go see the movie. <laughs> You're the best dad ever. Thanks. Okay, well, I knew we were gonna have this conversation, so I decided that I would make you my 
famous brownies. <laughs> These have been in the family for generations, for decades. Thank you. I'm going to take it with me and sneak it in the theater. <laughs> no, 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 no. Son, I want you to go ahead and eat the brownie now. Okay? Huh? Yeah, I want you to go ahead and eat it now. Okay. Same great ingredients that I've always put in the brownie, son. Since you were a little kid, mm. eggs, the cocoa, the butter, the flour, the vanilla. But I added something this time. Just a little bit of something, but you, I added some. You shouldn't mess with perfection. Well, that's kind of my point, son. Mm. Yeah. Was it paprika? No. Was it allspice? No. Was it allspice? No. What was it? Dog poop. Hmm? Dog poop. Dog. It is dog poop. From the big dog or the little dog? Little dog. That's a load off. Then, why would you? Son, it's just a little bit. It shouldn't affect the whole batch. It's just a little bit. I get it. What? No. What? The next time you don't want me to go see a movie, just say, son, don't go see the movie. Don't feed me. Poop brownies? I don't even want to see the movie now. I just want to go get something to drink. There better be lemonade in the refrigerator. I think I got one. What? Another one? You gotta be kidding me. Woo wee. This one's a beaut. Well, let me see. Uh, this is my third one today. 17th this week and 53rd this month. <laughs> I'm on a roll. Oh, take a look at this one. Uh, six feet two, 235 pound pasta. A oh, pasta? What? Come on, man. I can't even catch a back row Baptist and you call it pastor? Oh, stop your whining and take a picture with him. Fine, all right. All right, say sinners. Sinners. Oh, man, this, you know what, this just ain't fair. I'm putting in just as much as work as you are catching Christians, but you know what, you just keep catching them all and I'm getting nothing. That is the saddest story ever told. Don't patronize me. You know, you're just better at this than me. Yep. But I want to get better. I just don't know how. Sure wish I knew somebody who had a little bit of experience at catching Christians. You know, someone seasoned, somebody who could help me out, someone to, uh, who's an expert who wants to mentor a fellow demon out. You know, uh, you know anyone who might could do that? I'm not sure, but when I find someone like that, I'll let you know. Come on, Hornswoggle, I'm desperate. Desperate? Now there's a word I love. Here's what I'll do for you, Scabsworth. I'll tell you everything I know in exchange for your first five catches. You know what, fine, whatever. Just teach me, all right? All right. All right. Here's the deal. Catching Christians, it ain't as hard as it seems. Yeah, for you it's not. Just listen. It ain't as hard as it seems as long as you know a few things up front. Now, I ain't talking about knowledge you got from that fancy school for deceivers. No, I'm talking about real knowledge you learn from actually catching Christians. Pull in your line for me. All right. What kind of bait you using? Bait? You use bait? I just had my hook out there. Oh my, you're dumber than I thought. <sighs> Look, you ain't never gonna catch nothing worth catching unless you have the right bait. All right, fine, the right bait. So how do you know what's the right bait? Well, that's the tricky part. You see, not every type of bait works for every Christian. You gotta know a little bit about who you are trying to catch first. Well, what about that big old pastor you just caught? What kind of bait you use for him? Well, pastors, they can be tricky because they're leaders, you know. 
they typically know the Bible, and they know it pretty well, and they try to live right. So I didn't go for the obvious bait. With this one, I used a combination of lust and pride. You see, I dangled a pretty young secretary in front of him, one that I knew he'd find attractive. And then I convinced him that he deserved to make a mistake. In fact, he'd earned it after years of faithful marriage and commitment. And the pathetic little man believed me. Now he's mine. Well, what about for me? I've been trying to catch this Christian teen for a long time now, and I can't even get a bite. What bait would you recommend? Well, that depends on a few things. Mm -hmm. Is it a male or a female? Well, I'm planning on trying to catch the man first, but then I'm going to go for the girl after that. <laughs> well, that's awfully ambitious of you, considering you have no idea what you're doing. Go grab my tempting box. Oh, it's, it's right over there. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Well, with, with a male teen, I'd start with lust. Mm. They all struggle with it. And most of them, even the hardest to catch, don't recognize what's going on until it's too late. But if they're a particularly hard Christian to catch, you might need to cover that lust with something else. Wait, you put bait on top of bait? Isn't that a lot of work? Yep, it is. But you ain't gonna catch nothing worth catching without putting in some effort. Look, here's what to do. Sometimes I like to throw laziness and apathy on top of the lust. I just don't get it. That's cause you ain't so bright. But I'll spell it out for you anyway. You see, if you get them to start nibbling on the laziness and apathy, it gets them bored and disenchanted. Uh, they start to think, I've heard this all before and I don't care anymore. And then they start to let their guard down. And by the time they get to the lust, they ain't thinking with their right mind. They're just wanting something new and exciting, and that's when they're yours. All right, well, great. What about the girl? Well, it depends on the girl. But body image is always a good place to start. Most of these Christian girls floating around out here don't really believe that God made them the way he wanted them. No, they swimming around thinking he done made a mistake with them. Fools, I tell you. You get your girl trying to become something she ain't designed to be, comparing herself to everyone else, wanting what they got rather than what God got for them, and pretty soon, you have her right where you want her. That sounds great. Yep. And if that don't work on them, I got a special trick that I occasionally use. Oh, tell me. You just got to tell me. Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, I've kept it secret for a long time. It seems like a shame to share it now. Oh. Well, if I notice that someone seems to have control issues, even if they've been swimming with the enemy for a while, I sometimes throw a little money on the line. Money? Really? How does that work? Well, so many of them got this idea that money is always a gift from God. It's not? Sometimes it is, but sometimes, well, sometimes they ain't meant to be rich. They don't know how to handle that responsibility. Get to thinking that money is all for them. 
that God wants them to be rich and lavish and, and wasteful. You see, they always forget about the warnings that's attached to riches. So, I like to throw that money out there and watch them think that they live in their best, their best life now, when in fact, it's me suckering them in. Before long, they nibbling on that line, developing an unquenching hunger for more that'll never stop until they breathe their last breath. All right. Well, I think I'm ready. Oh, one more thing. Where are you trying to catch them? Well, I've just been throwing the line all over the place and hoping I get a bite. This ain't a sport of chance. It's a game of precision. You see that group of Christians over there? Yeah, I see them. If you just throw that line over there, yeah. you ain't none of them probably going to get a bite. What? You see, when they're together like that, they're harder to catch. Even if one of them starts to nibble on the bait, the others will probably see the hook and try and help out their friend. What you got to do is wait for one of them to wander off on their own. That's when you throw out your line. That's when you got the best chance of catching your very own Christian. Oh, well, I see one all by himself right over there. All right. I got your line ready. Cast it out. See what you can do. <laughs> there you go. Now you're fishing for Christians.
Hey everyone, do you know anybody whose goal in this new year is to go bankrupt? Do you know anybody who is thinking to themselves, you know, I really want to get hooked on pornography this year? Do you know anybody who is purposely planning to wreck their marriage just so they can alienate their kids this year? Do you know anybody who wants this year to lie or cheat or steal so they can lose the trust and respect that others have for them. How many of us know people who have intentionally set for themselves the objective of making stupid decision after stupid decision so that they can sabotage themselves and be filled with regret by the end of this year? The reality is that many people, by the conclusion of 2023, will have done exactly that. In the first talk in this No Regret series, we identified two ways to go about making good and godly decisions. Decide in advance you're going to live God's way, whatever the circumstance, and determine that godly values are going to direct your decision-making in all things. If we decide and determine in these ways, then when the temptation arises to self-sabotage by how we treat others or by how we spend money or by what we post online or by what we say or don't say to people or by how we allow our emotions to take over and bring hurt to ourselves or others, we won't give in to anything harmful or destructive because we've already pre-decided that every day we're going to live for Jesus and love like Jesus. If today you're making that commitment, would you say with me, I'm going to live for Jesus and love like Jesus. If you really mean that, let's say it together. I'm going to live for Jesus and love like Jesus. When we seek to live and love like Jesus, we won't be likely to give in to the temptation to do what feels good in the moment, but will eventually bring hurt and heartache and regret to us in the long run. When it comes to temptation, like my old Boy Scout motto said, we always need to be prepared in advance to do the right thing every time. How is that possible? The Apostle Paul writes, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. From the Greek in which Paul wrote, this can literally be translated, Be cautious. Be vigilant. Persevere. Persist. Be brave. Be empowered. When it comes to temptation, Jesus offers this challenge and warning. Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. How many of us who are followers of Jesus would say our spirits are eager to do the right thing, but we are weak again and again in following through and actually living and loving like Jesus? Why are we to be on guard? Why are we to stay alert? Why is it that again and again we don't seem to have the strength to stand firm in the faith? It's because of the evil one, the adversary of God. Satan is at work seeking to tempt us to make decisions that are damaging to us and others. Now, some of you may be like I once was for a long time. I thought most any talk about Satan, the devil, the evil one was make-believe. I thought it had to do with psychological projection. 
I thought that there was in reality no evil beyond the individual self. But then I became a prison chaplain and came to realize that as the Bible says, there are powers and principalities. There are forces of cosmic darkness and spiritual powers of evil that are beyond the individual self and that followers of Jesus are to fight against. Paul writes, It's my duty to make sure that Satan does not win even a small victory over us. For we don't want to be naive and then fall prey to his schemes. Paul wants us to not be naive about this. He does not want us to fail to understand the threat. Literally, he does not want us to be ignorant and fall prey to Satan's evil purposes. Now, even if you accept that you're up against spiritual powers, you may think, oh, I got this. I can deal with it. It's no biggie. I've got it covered. It ain't no thing. I'm not worried about whether I can handle it. This is what Paul says. Even if you think you can stand up to temptation, be careful not to fall. Studies have found evidence for what's called a restraint bias. It's the tendency for people to overestimate their capacity to control themselves when tempted. If you're overly confident that you can't be tempted by the dessert someone brings to the office, or by the chance to cheat on your taxes, or by the very attractive person who starts flirting with you, restraint bias may be taking place and you need to be careful not to fall. So, what are some ways that you and I might overcome restraint bias? What can help us to fight temptation? Craig Rochelle says we need to decide three things in advance. The first is, move the line. Imagine, there's a line here. It's red. It means stop. It means don't go there. It's a line that you say you won't cross. You say you've decided not to give into temptation and step over that line because that would be doing something that's against God's will. That's not best for you. That's sin. Now, how many of us, when it comes to red lines, say to ourselves, yeah, I know staying on this side of the line is the right thing to do. It's what God wants me to do. And knowing that, again and again, we still go right up to the line. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you feel me? We know it's a boundary line. We know it's for our own protection. We know it's for our own good. The psalmist writes, your boundary lines mark out pleasant places for me. And in the Hebrew language, the phrase pleasant places can have the meaning of sweet spot. God sets out boundary lines for us so that we'll live in our sweet spot, in places that are best for us. But what do we do? Again and again, we go right up to the boundary line pushing the envelope as far as we think we can get away with without actually crossing the line. We think it's okay to get as close as possible to the line because we believe we have the power, the willpower, not to cross over. But you and I know that time and again, it doesn't work out that way. How many of you have set a boundary line for yourself when you were dating. Here's the red line. You say to yourself, I'm not going to cross over. You think you can get so very close to the line, but you aren't going to do what you know God doesn't want you to do. But then, move the line. Don't push yourself in the position of violating the boundary line. 
Let's say you decide you're going to a club. You decide you're not going to cross the line. You say to yourself, I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to hook up. But then you need to move the line. Don't put yourself in the position of violating the boundary line. Now, you may say, but that's so restrictive. That's so legalistic, so limiting. Uh, according to God, the boundary lines are for our good. They keep us from doing that which is not best for us and about which we eventually will have regrets. A second thing to fight temptation is to decide in advance to magnify the cost. How do you do that? Ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen if I do this? What's the worst possible outcome if I give in to temptation and cross over the red line? What's the worst case scenario of my sabotaging myself? Am I going to end up struggling mightily or suffering hugely if I decide to do this? Am I going to do it to myself again? Will I lose my reputation? Will I wreck my marriage? Will I betray a friendship? Will I lose my job? Ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong? Will someone get pregnant? Will I catch a disease? Will I ruin my life financially for years to come? Will my kids hate me? Now, you may think there's no reason for you to even consider what the worst case consequences are for you for stepping over the line and giving in to temptation because you're certain you're never going to be found out. And besides, like you saw in the video clip, it's just a little thing. It doesn't really matter. But then you find yourself metaphorically eating poop brownies. At least I hope it's metaphorical. But here's what the Bible says. And you may be sure that your sin will be discovered. It will be brought out into the open. To fight temptation, move the line, then magnify the cost, and then plan your escape. The most effective way to fight temptation is to avoid it altogether by moving the line further and further away from you. If that doesn't work, then count the cost of the pain and hurt and heartache that will come to you if you give into temptation. And if that doesn't work, plan your escape to remove yourself from the tempting circumstances. In the Old Testament, there was a guy named Joseph. He was a handsome, well-built young man. His boss was named Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife started to lust after Joseph. She started coming on to him. Now, for you younger guys, if a cougar had the hots for you, and kept saying she wanted to sleep with you, how would you respond? Imagine how easy it would have been for Joseph to give in to temptation. He was single, and she made the move, so it must have been okay for him to say, sure, why not, right? After all, Joseph's brother had beaten him up and sold him into slavery. It would have been easy for Joseph to say that God had let him down. And so he deserved to do what he wanted. Like the demon character in the drama convinced the pastor that he deserved to have an affair. Joseph chose not to step across that red line and disobey God. Joseph knew the cost would be huge if he gave in to temptation. So he did not fall weak. He remained strong. When Potiphar's wife moved way beyond trying to seduce Joseph with her words and tried to take off his clothes, Joseph knew his escape plan. He knew where the exit was and he was out of there. 
He ran for it, leaving his cloak in her hand. Now, here's the deal. The issue isn't whether or not you're going to be tempted in life. You are. You are tempted in the same way that everyone else is tempted. But God can be trusted not to let you be tempted too much, and He will show you how to escape from your temptations. God can be trusted not to let you be tempted too much, and He will show you how to escape from your temptations. Very few of us plan intentionally to sabotage ourselves and screw up our lives by giving in to temptation. But the reality is, people do it again and again. You need to be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. You need to stay alert and pray so you won't give in to temptation. You need to avoid putting yourself in tempting situations by going right up to the line of doing what you know God doesn't want you to do. Because eventually, you'll find yourself in a place God doesn't want you to be. And if you truly want to live a God-honoring life, you don't want to be either. As this new year begins, would you honestly ask yourself, what are the ways that you're most vulnerable to give in to temptation? Does your pride lead you again and again to make choices that are outside of God's will? Do you justify your sin because you're mad at God, because you believe God wasn't there for you when life wasn't working out the way you wanted? Do you give in to your insecurity and lie to make yourself look better or buy things you can't afford so others will think you're all that. Do you gossip about others or put them down as a way of trying to build yourself up? Are you overly critical? Are you judgingly condemning of others, thinking you're better than they are? Are you holding on to anger and unforgivingness deep in your spirit? Are you repeatedly giving into lust, either online or in person, though you're trying to hide it? Do you repeatedly give in to the emotion of the moment and do what feels good to you, even if it separates you more and more from God and from the people you say you love, though you mostly try and deny that? Are you self-sabotaging? This is a new year. It can be a time of new beginning for you. You don't have to keep living the way you've been living. You don't have to keep making the same destructive choices again and again. You don't have to let your pride lead you to think you know better than God. So you can do whatever you want to do. You can decide in advance to distance yourself from temptation. You can decide in advance to count the cost of the loss of integrity and innocence and self-respect when dishonoring God and not give in to temptation. You can intentionally plan ways to escape from temptation, even if that means you'll be spending less time with friends or family who, if you're honest, are leading you to live in ways that over time will damage you and your relationship with God. Most of us know what we should do and what we shouldn't do. It's a matter of deciding, are we going to live the Jesus way, believing that is best, or are we not? You get to decide what's it going to be. Let's pray together. O oh, Creator God, who's given us the gift of life, you want for us to live life at its very best. You want us to experience life that is fulfilled, a, a life that is blessed, a, a life that brings joy and happiness, a life in which we know contentment. And yet, God, there are so many times when we are tempted to give in to do things that we know 
are against your will that we know that are wrong. And we think, oh, it's just a little thing. But those little decisions can lead to such self-destructiveness, to harm and to hurt and to heartache. So God, I'm praying for all of us today that we would be strong, we would be courageous, that we would have a sense of the moving of your Holy Spirit in our lives and we would withstand temptation, we would stand firm in the face. We would just live like Jesus every moment of every day. And when we do that, we will know the kind of life that we yearn for. And we won't do those self-sabotaging things that have messed us up again and again. So God, first, we confess any of those things we've done wrong and we ask for you to forgive us and cleanse us. And in this new year, Lord, give us a second chance. Give us a new beginning. Help us to live all like for Jesus. We pray these things in His holy name. Amen. We are genuinely glad that you have been a part of this worship experience online. We hope that you've had, had a sense that God is calling you to something new, something different, something better. And if you would like to have a conversation could be online, via Zoom, text, by phone, about how is it that you move forward in faith? How do you connect with Jesus in a life-changing way? I invite you to go to our website, journeyconnection.com. Click on the e-connect card there. Let us know how we might be in contact with you. Let us know how we might pray for you. And if you're a part of our online congregation, know that you matter to us. You are a part of us. And we want to serve you, and we want you to have the opportunity to be in significant relationship with people in our church family. If you're a part of our online congregation, or if you're a part of our hybrid congregation, sometimes you're online, sometimes you're, you're in person. We want to make sure you know that you can participate in making all these ministries possible. You can follow the example of Jesus and be generous in your giving. So if you go to our website, journeyconnection.com, you can find the giving tab there. You can give online. If you choose, you can send it in through the mail. It's a way that you can say, I belong. I'm a part of this church family. I want to make a difference for Jesus. And when you give, you bless so many lives in our community of faith, but also in our wider community. Part of your gift would be sent to the Salvation Army, one of our ministry partners. They care for people in need, but particularly they have a ministry for women who are battered and abused. When you give generously, you help us to support that. Thank you so much for wanting to be more and more like Jesus and be giving. I hope you'll join us again next weekend as we continue in our series, No Regrets. God bless. God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. to do the same thing for me oh god my god i need you oh god my god i need you now how i need you now oh rock oh rock of ages i'm standing on your faithfulness your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David. Yeah.
God, my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same God you were providing